Ryan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, we may need to find a, a larger venue next year. Um, I really appreciate you all being here. We, I want to start by acknowledging that we have a few special guests here today. We have uh, Heather Mulvihill, who's here, who's the chair of the board of the, of the Depression, Johnson Depression Center. Kevin Reedy is here, who's working on a fund that I'll talk about in a little while. We have Ted Harms, who's here as the executive director of our largest philanthropic partner, the Anschutz Foundation. And from our hospital management, we have Chris Gessner and Liz Concordia from UC Health and Jenna Hausman, the CEO of Children's Hospital. So, I can promise you we wouldn't be, I wouldn't be standing in front of you today with a story that I'm about to tell you without the help of all of those people. So please give them a round of applause. We've often said this is a coalition of the willing, and sometimes we're more willing than others. But anyway, uh, uh, for the most part, it, it works pretty well. Anyway, it's a privilege for me to be here today to talk to you about the state of our campus. Uh, as we all know, uh, who work on an academic medical campus, it's kind of hard to explain uh, to people who aren't steeped in it why it works. There's so many highly developed areas of expertise across the spectrum of education, research, and care, and somehow when they all come together, the results can be extraordinary. It, feels some it can feel something like this. I love that cartoon. The good news here is that I think I can explain about the middle of our equation. The miracles here happen because of you, all of you. They happen because of our partner organizations, especially our hospitals, and their collaboration, which collectively lifts all of our boats. And most of all, the, happen, the, the miracles happen here because of our faculty, our staff, and students, those here in this room, and those watching online. They happen because we're united in a common purpose to provide the finest health care in the world, to push the science behind that care to new horizons, and to train those who will deliver that care in the future. Because of you, all of you, the state of our campus in 2019 is, in a word, strong. But we have this room for a few more minutes, so I'll take an opportunity to elaborate <laughs> on that single word. Today, I'm going to talk briefly about the year that's just passed, our progress and some priority areas that we laid out for the campus three years ago, the challenges we face, what's ahead, and most importantly, why it all matters. As we've done every year since we've moved to this campus, we've shown solid growth. Let's look, take a look at some of the top line numbers from last year. Total university revenues were up by 2.19 were, were $2 billion dollars a 7% increase from the prior year, with clinical revenues accounting for about half of that. Our clinical volumes continue to increase. This campus had 2.1 million patient visits last year. That's an astounding number, and it's a 5% increase over the prior year. Our faculty body grew by 4% last year, and now numbers over 5,000. The most astonishing part about that is it's a 76% increase in faculty since we moved here, completed our move here in 2010. But beyond quantity, the quality of our faculty continues to soar. Whether new to the team or seasoned veterans, our faculty have been and will continue to be the foundation of the excellence on this campus. Sponsored research was up by 7% last year with new awards totaling over $550 million for the first time. Philanthropy hit yet another record all-time high, with $324 million raised from 6,600 benefactors. As excited as we are about the amount of philanthropy on this campus, we're just as excited about the dramatic increase in the number of gifts, which grew from 16,000 in 2017 to over 18,000 last year. I need to give a huge shout out to Scott Arthur and his team 
along with and importantly with their faculty partners because we wouldn't be doing this without them. So the growth last year was robust, but our five-year progress is even more impressive. These numbers paint a broad picture of continued and very steep trajectory in all the areas that academic medical centers traditionally measure. And unlike many of our peers in large metropolitan areas, we actually have room to grow. <laughs> our new Anschutz Health Science Building, which we think of as 390,000 square feet of possibilities, has been taking shape since breaking ground last January. Both hospitals are expanding dramatically to, increase, to meet growing clinical demand and capacity challenges. University Hospital is starting its third inpatient tower and Children's is building out previously shelved space. While both systems are expanding facilities up and down the front range that will not only provide care locally to their patients, but will feed tertiary and quaternary care to this campus. Our schools and colleges are continuing to fill their critical role in educating and training the healthcare workforce. While some of our schools are facing market pressures, many of our education programs are now in more demand than ever before. To give you a sense, last year there were more than 3,000 applicants for 670 spots in our nursing programs. We had over 2,000 applicants for 80 spots in dental medicine. And what I think is a ridiculous number, we had 10,000 applicants for 184 slots in the entry-level class for the School of Medicine. Over the last 10 years, applications from highly qualified students for our biomedical PhD programs have nearly doubled, and a task force recently recommended a substantial increase in the number of PhD students across the research disciplines to continue this upward trajectory. On the curriculum side, we're working to ensure that our programs are evolving to meet changing needs. Among our new academic offerings over the last two years, two new tracks in biomedical science and biotechnology, a new master's and PhD program in health economics in partnership with CU Denver, master's degrees in clinical pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences, a PhD in pharmaceutical outcomes research, and a new fellowship in palliative care. In addition, as many of you know, we signed an MOU with Colorado State University this summer to begin planning a medical school branch in Fort Collins to go along with our three-year-old location in Colorado Springs. Our efforts to build a healthy future for the community in which we live and work also gained steam last year. Building on the efforts of the Dawn Clinic, we're collaborating with partner organizations in Aurora and the Salud Family Health Centers to plan the Aurora Community Health Commons Project, led by the School of Medicine and with invited participation from all the schools and colleges. This federally qualified health center will, will, will be able to serve approximately 4,600 unserved or underserved citizens of Aurora in an interprofessional care delivery model. Almost exactly three years ago, we suggested a number of priorities for the future of this campus, and I'm happy to report on progress in those areas. The first was to continue invest in, to invest in clinical excellence. It's really the fuel that, that, that powers the campus. It gives me great pleasure to say that our hospital affiliates and our relationships with them are as strong or stronger than ever. Driven by our faculty, Children's Hospital Colorado is now back in the top 10 nationally as ranked by US News and World Report. And the University of Colorado Hospital remains the number one adult hospital in Colorado. We are working with both our hospital partners to jointly invest, invest in a number of shared programs and assets, including the Cancer Center, the Center for Personalized Medicine, uh, clinical trial software, regenerative medicine, and behavioral health care, and faculty recruitment in a host of specialties. Sharing a campus with a highly ranked pediatric and adult hospital puts us in select company. By our count, we are among only a handful of campuses in the country that has that base. Not to overstate it, but I believe that our ability to leverage that asset, research and care across the lifespan, Will, will define the arc of our future success. The second goal was to increase and diversify research funding. While our sponsored research revenues, as I said before, grew by about 7% last year to a total of $553 million in new awards, the NIH portion of that was actually up even more, 
up 14 percent, and it's critical that we may remain competitive in NIH funding. What's more, support in other areas of research funding is up as well, by 14 percent from industry and 16 percent from associations and foundations. Let me cite just two examples behind those numbers. CU Anschutz faculty, led by Joaquin Espinosa in the Cernic Institute, and with the help of the Global Down Syndrome Foundation, just received $8.2 million in NIH grant funding to, research on, to, 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 to advance research on Down syndrome with co-occurring conditions. That represented 23% of the total bolus of that pot of money that was offered by the NIH. Let me repeat, 23% of one whole grant pocket ended up in one institution, ours. The Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine, now five years old, has received $26.7 million in research funding to date. With the first enterprise health data warehouse on a highly secure and HIPAA-protected cloud platform, its personalized registry, uh, medicine registry now has more than 100,000 patients enrolled and 30,000 samples genotyped. Last October, this, the registry launched its process, process of return of results, which provides state-of-the-art critical to clinical decision support to our physicians. Ours is one of the first personalized medicine programs in the country to integrate the clinical use of pharmacogenomics via, via a research biobank, and it's one of just five in the country that has more than, more than 30,000 samples and is already returning genetic results to the clinic. Finally, and importantly, we've teamed with Children's Hospital over the last year to, to evaluate how we're supporting child health research on the campus with the goal of significantly improving both the support for that service and the efficiency of it. One of our greatest assets with, res with, with respect to research, and in fact with everything that we do on this campus, is the collaborative spirit that we have, and we can never take that for granted. One particular aspect of that collaboration is the respect and civility with which we treat our colleagues, including those with whom we might disagree. Our diversity in all of its forms, including that of opinion, is a great source of pride, and our different identities and viewpoints enrich the learning and professional environment for all of us. Moving on to innovation, the re-engineering of our technology transfer operation is yielding some impressive results. Look at these increases from where we were four years ago. Invention disclosures, up 43%. Technology licenses, up 55%. And the number of startups formed up 133%. In the last year alone, CU Anschutz faculty external startup companies raised over $100 million, and over 500 companies applied for access to our innovation centers, and both hospitals received national recognition for their work. Just last month, the campus was selected by the NIH as one of the top re innovation research centers in the country. We are now designated as an NIH Research Evaluation and Commercialization Hub, and will receive a $4 million grant over four years to scale our SPARC program, a partnership of CU Innovations, the CCTSI, and the Cancer Center. Currently in the second year, the SPARC cohort has, cohort has already raised over $7 million in follow-up funding, launched several startups, and recruited over 25 industry mentors from around the country to assist our faculty in the process of transitioning their discoveries into products that will improve health. We also have, now have a relationship with an external fund, which we haven't yet announced, but it is coming, uh, of up to $50 million to support innovation at companies associated with this campus. We've been challenged for years by a lack of support, both in terms of funding and personnel, for bringing our ideas to market. There is a quote that says, a vision without money is a hallucination. <laughs> Pretty good quote. I'm happy to say that with the SPARC program, Gates, Gates Grubstake Awards, a Chancellor's Innovation Fund, and now this external fund, our vision is closer to realization. These accomplishments have been achieved through the work of many, but I'd especially like to call out Kim Muller and Steve Van Nerden at CU Innovations and their colleagues, Rich Zane and Steve Hess at UC Health and their colleagues, and Robin Dieterding and her colleagues at Children's Hospital. Collectively, they have done an amazing job. 
The next priority was mental health, and I couldn't be prouder of the work that's going on in this area. Through the efforts of so many people on this campus, we are making progress toward more fully integrating mental and behavioral health into our patient care environments and our curriculum. And I hope we're making strides toward reducing the harmful stigma that too often keeps people in need of the, of the quality of quality mental, mental health care from actually seeking it. Our hospital partners are weighing in heavily in this area. Last fall, Children's Hospital Colorado teamed with our Department of Psychiatry to launch Partners for Children's Mental Health, a statewide network of individuals, organizations, and agencies helping kids get the right mental health at the right time and right in their own community. And UC Health's huge announcement in September that it will invest over $100 million to build out its behavioral health care offerings throughout the state will ensure that behavioral health, ther behavioral health therapists are an integral part of the patient care experience. We're also bolstering support of our students' mental health. We've expanded our services and availability of the student mental health service, which is now coordinating more closely with the Campus Health Center. We've launched the UHCU Anschutz portal, and we're increasing wellness programming across the board. We still have a long way to go down that road. I don't think it ever has an end, but we're committed to the journey. Finally, we talked about marketing, and I'll have a lot to say about that in a bit. So we've continued to experience rapid growth in most key areas, and not just in the past year, but really every year since we've been on this campus. That said, life is not a bed of roses. In reporting to you on the state of the campus, I would be remiss if I did not also mention what I see coming as continuing challenges for the campus and for the field of healthcare. The first and most obvious is the continually rising cost of healthcare. We have a very real obligation to be part of the solution to what is an unsustainable pattern. The second, and it's totally related to the first, <coughs> is the impact of shifting government policies on the healthcare marketplace. Looming state and federal legislation has the potential to significantly impact our economics. At the state level, it's very clear that the Polis administration has placed a bullseye on healthcare costs, with the center of that eye on hospital expenses. At the federal level, the 2020 election obviously has enormous potential for creating market disruption. These are very real headwinds that are appearing on our horizon. And let me be clear, anything that happens to our part, anything that impacts our partners' economics impacts ours as well. Federal funding for scientific research and the NIH and other agencies face an uncertain future. While we're more hopeful here, with the climate that we have in Washington today, anything can happen. Outside of funding, regulatory guidelines, especially in the new areas of biologic, present new hurdles, new and shifting hurdles. Frankly, we've struggled with issues here, and we need to invest in our capabilities. And largely because of our rapid growth, we have infrastructure issues. The need for better transportation access, parking, and nearby amenities, these are all constraints. Challenges driven by growth are nice problems to have, but they're still problems. So what's ahead? We do expect some exciting developments in the coming year. Here are a few in brief. We will continue to see growth in our clinical practices. The FQHC I mentioned earlier will open in Aurora in a temporary location in advance of its permanent campus on, on Colfax. Bioscience 3 will open on the Fitzsimmons Innovation Campus with greatly expanded space and programming for bioengineering. We will launch new educational offerings in public health and personalized medicine. We will have a plan to grow and consolidate effort, efforts in data sciences. We will launch a program to provide funding for collaborative research with our colleagues in Boulder. We will begin first in human investigator-initiated trials in cellular therapy with our faculty in our clinics. We will have a plan to, pro to, to process and reduce the time it takes us to start a clinical trial from where it is now, which is unacceptable, to under 90 days. We will see the continued growth of CU Innovation Partnerships with round three of SPARC and round four of the Grubstake Awards. And that's just a taste of what's happening. I've spoken at some length today about numbers and volumes and revenues, and those are all pretty good stories and very good measures of success. 
but I don't want to lose sight of the forest for the trees. More importantly than the numbers is our work's purpose. Everything that we do, all of it, matters for the simple reason that it's in service of people. Finding the next cure, improving the lives of our patients, and teaching the future of healthcare professionals to do the same. If you really want to see why our work matters, just take a walk around the campus. You can talk to a new dental student who's using virtual reality technology to practice the fine motor skills and hand-eye coordination that her field requires. It matters that she's at one of only a handful of schools in the country to offer this. Her education is further enhanced by the diversity of perspectives in a class that is now 25% underrepresented minorities. Or talk to Jason Stoneback, who's pioneering new osteo-integration surgery for amputees. Because of Dr. Stoneback and his limb restoration program team, patients who were running out of options when traditional socket prosthesis failed them now have the possibility of, in, of an innovative bone anchoring device implanted in their femur and their tibia, allowing them to move with less discomfort, more sensation, and significantly improved quality of life. Or talk, or talk to Dan Pallier about the mood in his acute myeloid leukemia clinic, le le clinic these days. His clinical trials, using research from Craig Jordan's lab, led to a treatment breakthrough that showed a 91% response rate in a condition that had for decades almost always been fatal. His clinics, in his words, have gone from a somber, depressing place to, where, to one where we don't talk much about cancer anymore. You can see why our work matters in all corners of the state. Go to the southwest Denver suburbs and talk to Joey, the asthmatic kid who has managed not only to avoid the ER, but is fulfilling his dream of playing Friday night football, thanks to services he's received from the CU Health Clinic at a school run by CU Nursing's Alexis Barrer and her staff. Talk to the people in El Paso County who are worried about the elevated levels of PFA in the chemicals in their blood due to contaminants in their drinking water. They're glad the Colorado School of Public Health is about to embark on a research program to determine just what the exposure risks and health impacts of that condition are. Near Steamboat Springs, you can talk to Ashley, who struggled for years with an opioid addiction and couldn't get treatment for, with, without traveling to either Grand Junction or Denver. She finally found the help she needed right in her community through a medicated assistant treatment program at the clinic run by nursing, a successful a program so successful that Governor Polis recently expanded it to the San Luis Valley. Or talk to patients across the state who aren't getting addicted to opioids in the first place because their doctors trained through the Center for Pre Prescription Drug Abuse and Prevention are now providing alternatives for pain management. You can actually see where our work matters across the globe. Talk to a patient in Australia who has epilepsy so severe that until recently she couldn't drive to work or even walk to the mailbox alone for fear of, fall fear of falling or blacking out. With a, with a pump in her abdomen, distributing a, a concentrated epilepsy drug directly to her brain, developed by Tom Antrodeke from, I got it right, didn't I, Tom? Thank you. <laughs> I prefer if everybody in this room was named Smith. Um, <laughs> from the CU Skag School of Pharmacy, she's now commuting to work and talking about having children, things she couldn't have even dreamed of a couple of years ago. Talk to the family of eight-year-old Mario in the Trifinios region of Guatemala, who was suffering from a dental infection so bad it left him incapacitated and in fact threatened his life. After CU Dental students extracted six teeth, that must have been fun, the swelling and the infection resolved. Thanks to the basic health and education services provided by all of our schools and colleges at the Center for Human Development, Mario's family and 30,000 other rural Guatemalans are looking to brighter futures. Or talk to the patients from around the world who bring their battle with pancreatic cancer here because they know we're up for the fight. We do know that what we, what we do here matters, that our particular combination of clinical practice, education, and, research, and research results in world-class science and exceptional care. We know this because we work here, but we felt for a long time that the rest of the world didn't know our story. I promised last year that we would try to find a way to tell the world that story and develop a plan to communicate the collective impact of this campus. And I'm happy to say that I think we're making good progress. 
The first step was to shift our domain from, C, uh, from CU Denver, or UC Denver.edu to CU Anschutz.edu over the spring and summer. Next, we developed a new marketing campaign this year with one key element. It jointly promotes all three major entities. Our This Is Breakthrough campaign illustrates how, together with our partner hospitals, we're breaking down barriers to accomplish the extraordinary. Perhaps most exciting of all, the campaign features our own people, hi highlighting their, ver their visionary work and the innovations they've achieved. See for yourself in this video. Get in, we're going. Where? To shape the future. All right here. Leave your doubts, bring your dreams, bring your theories, bring snacks, bring it. We're going to challenge everything. We're gonna push ourselves, push boundaries, and push buttons. We're gonna take risks, take notes, take names, find new innovations, new discoveries, new ways to transform lives. This is where we stand up all day and stay up all night. This is where we ask questions, find answers, and attack the toughest health problems on the planet. This is the place where every single cell within each and every one of us comes together for something bigger. This is the intersection of education, research, and patient care, where tomorrow's breakthroughs happen today. This is Children's Hospital, Colorado. This is UC Health. This is the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. And this is Breakthrough. This is Breakthrough. This is Breakthrough. This is Breakthrough. The talent and collaboration on this campus does lead to countless breakthroughs, all in the service of what matters most, the improved health of our patients and our community. It matters and it will continue to matter to families and to communities everywhere who rely on us for hope, for healing, and for life. May we never lose sight of how priceless and important that mission is. Thank you very much. At great personal risk, I'm willing to answer a few questions. <laughs> I hear none. Great, that's terrific. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> I really do appreciate all you being here. Thanks very much. And more importantly, thanks for everything that you do, because it is you that make this place what it is. So thanks a lot. Have a great evening.